Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. Today we'll be talking about one of the greatest military commanders in our nation's history and the 34th President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And we have with us a noted historian, Irvin F. Gelman, who has written several books on Eisenhower and will tell us all about this new one. But before we get started, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up soon in this theater. A week from today, on September 30th at noon, we'll welcome Michael Paulson, a leading scholar of constitutional interpretation. His new book, The Constitution, covers its history and meaning in clear, accessible terms, and a book signing will follow that program. And on the same day, September 30th at 7 p.m., we'll present a program called 1920 Style, Prohibition Era Fashion, with Tim Gunn, star of television's Project Runway. An illustrated discussion uh, and fashion show will explore this exciting period of American fashion history, and the evening will end with the dance performance by Fidgety Feet. If you want to know more about these and all of our upcoming exhibits and programs, consult our monthly calendar events. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership also in the lobby. Today's discussion of Dwight Eisenhower centers on the theme of the fall issue of our Prologue magazine, which um, has a special section commemorating the 125th anniversary of Eisenhower's birth. This issue carries several articles on Eisenhower and some ex excerpts from our speaker's new book. Prologue is available in the shop upstairs, as well as the book is available up there. To, to introduce today's speaker, I'd like to call forth a special guest, retired Air Force General Carl W. Riddell, who has until recently been Executive Director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Gov General Riddell has worked with the Commission since 2001, while he was Public Service Fellow in the Center for Public Service at Gettysburg College. Earlier, he was Professor and Head of the History Department at the United States Air Force Academy. The General has studied at the Institute for the Study of the USSR in Munich and at the U.S. Army Russian Institute uh, Garmisch in Germany and Moscow State University in Russia. He also holds a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees respectively from Drake University, the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, and Indiana University. Please welcome General Carl Riddell. Thank you, David, and welcome to all of you. What a special occasion this is for the executive director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Uh, having worn the uniform with pride, the discovery of a great American who both wore the uniform and was our 34th uh, president, I realized that I was dealing with one of the best pieces of evidence that this great American experiment works. And so I'm really privileged to speak with you here today, to be in the National Archives itself, to be talking about this celebrated and to be now nationally celebrated citizen of ours who is by Public Law 10679, the Congress of the United States to be represented as the first National Presidential Memorial of the 21st century and the seventh of our National Presidential Memorials. To be in the archives is special today and I'm making this a little bit of a in different introduction because I guess the years, as the years go by, you come to have a different appreciation of things. I've come to realize that for us as a democracy that the archives of the United States are very much an essential part of our national memory collectively as a nation and our individual memory as citizens of this great historic experiment. And that the archives, in the best sense, are a functioning part 
of this democracy of which all of us are a part and that Eisenhower was so important for during the 20th century. So the archives in a way is part of the laboratory of historic data by which we get an idea whether this experiment is really working or not working. But that doesn't just happen. The energizing verb, if you will, in this relationship between archives and citizens and so forth needs the energizing verb of the professional historian. And that's what we have with us today, a superb example of what it means in a, for a democracy to have an individual that knows as a professional how to use the great resources that this institution, for example, represents in part. So among the leading Eisenhower scholars, your speaker today is not just considered a master of archives, he is considered the master of the Eisenhower archives. And where does my confidence in such a generalization come from? And it comes from the fact that over the last 10 years as executive director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, I took the commission's direction and it began its work by assessing the scholarship on Eisenhower. And it has monitored and tracked the scholarship on Eisenhower throughout its existence. And the conclusion is that the Eisenhower legacy is world-class and deserving of a world-class location, which is now to be at the base of the Capitol, and a world-class <coughs> memorial. Different events have happened along the way, which are quite special, culmination points. I did not know when I started this work that, yes, in the year 2001, Johns Hopkins University would finish a project started by Dwight David Eisenhower and his youngest brother, Milton, when Milton was the president of Johns Hopkins. 30 years after that, the 21 volumes of the paper of Dwight David Eisenhower are finished, a vector that's going across our historical firmament nationally in a way that was, had a life all its own. But that same year, two World War II veterans, Senator Ted Stevens and Senator Daniel Inouye, decided that there should be a national celebration of Eisenhower that same year. These vectors came across and came together. This year, in the year 2015, Yale University Press announced the publication of the book about which you're going to hear today and on which the presentation is based in the year 2015. And it's in the year 2015, just within the last several months, that all the final approvals are in on the design of the Eisenhower Memorial. So again, a confluence of events. So our author fits into this in a special way, and I've looked at the program that you have, and it outlines his academic career and what he's about as a professional historian, but I, let me tell you, I've looked at this in greater depth, and he has done all of the academic dimensions of uh, what are prestigious and in place uh, work and excellence of a high order. His academic role ranging from professor to dean and looking after programs. Uh, I won't begin to mention uh, all of his publications and presentations, but sterling in a very special way, let alone his real world assessment as a successful entrepreneur and businessman and his work with nonprofits. But it is important for you to know that he is indeed an expert on the presidency and on select presidents. His first three highly regarded books were on President Roosevelt, and his fourth book was on Richard Nixon. So his fellow colleagues in Eisenhower over the years have come to tell me that this man is indispensable for the belief that you have worked the archives in a way that is truly professional. So. This magnificent book, which is going to be on sale here uh, shortly, this magnificent book is not just extraordinary documentation in its volume and its detail, but believe me, it's innovative discovery and uncovering of sources and data, which represent not only new thinking, but new discoveries, and in the words of one Eisenhower scholar, irrefutable conclusions and research. So it's indeed a privilege and an honor for me to introduce to you our fellow citizen professor, Erwin Gelman. Thank you, Carl.
Thank you for coming. I know there's somebody else in town right now, but I do appreciate you coming, and I want to start with a couple of, of housekeeping things for me. Uh, I started researching in 1965, and I first came here then, and I still can't get over how remarkable the National Archives is. And David Ferriero represents the best of it because he represents the quest for scholarship and his administration represents that. And as far as Carl Rodell goes and the Eisenhower Commission, uh, that commission couldn't do any better. You are as good as it gets. So, you know, thank goodness we have two gentlemen that really not only know their material, not only are well trained in their material, but they're passionate about their material. Uh, I also have one other person uh, to introduce also, and that's my wife sitting over there, Gloria. And I have learned, I have learned there are only two words for a happy marriage, and we just celebrated our 26th year. And for those of you that don't know those two words, it's yes, dear. So uh, that is part of it. I first came here, like I said, in 1965. And I was doing security search work uh, in room 5E. And you had to walk up there and press a little button. And this very serious looking woman named Patricia Dowling came out. And she would let you in and let you out and let you in and let you out. Well, when I was doing my dissertation, I was working from early in the morning to late at night. And there was another uh, uh, gentleman named Jonathan Utley who was also working on his dissertation. And after about six months of 12 hours a day of doing this, we got a little squirrely. And we started singing The Temptations, My Girl. And when we got to my girl, boop, boop, she threw us, our butts out. But she let us back in. Ten years later, after I had become a dean, you'll never guess who wrote Patricia Dowling's application for promotion. And that was my honor. Now, there are other, there are other minimal pieces of, of uh, things about the archives. One, uh, someone that Carl Rudell referred to was Evan Thomas. And he's written a book based on much work in the archives called Being Nixon. You should take a look at that. It pre presents a very much uh, nuanced Richard Nixon. Uh, a, uh, Jeff Shepard has spent a great deal of time in the National Archives. And he also uh, has written a book on the real uh, Watergate uh, material. Uh, one of my friends that that uh, Carl is well aware of is David Nichols. And he spent a great deal of time in the National Archives and the Eisenhower Library. And he's coming out with a big book on Eisenhower and Joe McCarthy. So there's a bunch of material that's coming out. But what I want to talk to you about today is something that hasn't come out. And that is Eisenhower and Foreign Affairs. Now, more than any other subject on Eisenhower, like three quarters of all the stuff that's written about Eisenhower is foreign affairs. Do any of you know a big book called Dwight Eisenhower and American Foreign Policy? It doesn't exist. It should, but it doesn't exist. Because most of the people that do the archives and Dwight Eisenhower don't understand how Eisenhower operated. And what I want to do today with you is to explain the nature of how this guy operated. And by the way, he not only operated, but he operated brilliantly. I find him the singular most well-trained person to run the federal bureaucracy. He was remarkable at what he did. Now, I'm a computer atavism. I, 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 I was using WordPerfect as my program until a couple of years ago and, and kicked and, stream, and screamed as I came out to Word. But if this doesn't work, I hope it does. I want to explain Eisenhower's background. 
Eisenhower was born in Texas, but moved early to Kansas, lived in Abilene. He grew up in a rural setting. And to give you a clue how rural the setting was, when I went up uh, to do my first work in the Eisenhower Library in the mid-60s, I went to a ratty hotel or motel. I wore my shoes to shower. It was, I thought, dangerous to walk in without shoes on. So that gives you an idea of how really cosmopolitan Abilene was in the late 1960s. But he grew up there. And he moved from there to West Point. And he moved from West Point to being a young officer. And what most people don't understand about this is, he goes, his, one of his early assignments is Panama. So he gets this remarkable view of the strategic value of Central America, Latin America, and how important the Panama Canal and the whole Caribbean and that area surrounding is important to United States security. Well, where else does he go? He goes to the Philippines, which is mysteriously over there somewhere. And he works while he's there under, uh, under uh, General Douglas MacArthur. And if anybody was going to be trained in pomposity and bombast, that was the guy that you served under. But again, for all of the, the, the negatives that Douglas MacArthur brought, he also was genius. And Eisenhower trained with him too. Well, Eisenhower also goes other places. He's in, in the United States, where he uh, has various places of command. He goes to North Africa as uh, the invasions there. He is in England. He is in Western Europe. So he pretty well covers the map. And the reason why I want to point this out to you is for one very serious reason. And that is, I hear today people who are running for president say, I really don't need to know this stuff. I can hire an expert. Well. I don't have any problem with that. I would be the first to admit that I don't know everything and know very little. But at least I have a concept. And if you don't have the concept and the world training and the world view that Eisenhower had, how can you rely on experts that you don't know are experts because you don't have a global view? And the greatness of Eisenhower was, for as many places he was, for as many different experiences that he had, and for who he was trained with. I mean, think of the epical figures that Eisenhower met with before he was president of the United States. De Gaulle, Churchill, Marshall, Patton. I mean, th these people, in their own right, had extraordinary careers. And Eisenhower had to somehow get along with these folks or he couldn't have been supreme commander. So one of the things that Eisenhower learned very early in all of this was how do you get decisions made? And rather than the world of polarization that we live in today, his idea was how do you find a solution to problems? And one of the most serious solutions that he found was how do you conduct foreign policy? Do all of you remember all of the wars we fought under Eisenhower? I don't see any hands. What war? I agree, but how many, how many American? I, 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 agree. I, I, I agree with that, but how many American soldiers' lives were lost and how many declarations of war do we have? I don't blame, I don't, I don't argue that, but as he, he signed the armistice for that. But how many wars did Eisenhower take us into? Zero. Now, I agree with you that in the future there are certain things that happened that were directly related back to Eisenhower, and one of those things which is untrue I'll get to also. But the fact is that under Eisenhower we didn't go into any other foreign wars. And the gentleman up there is right. How he used the, the CIA was really questionable in many regards. But from Eisenhower's standpoint, the way he used the CIA 
came out of his World War II experience with the OSS. And whether it was successful in the, sh the long run or whether it was not successful in the long run is another uh, issue that you can ask me about later. But here's what I want to do. Eisenhower becomes president of the United States. He's elected in November. Now, we all know that Eisenhower goes to Korea. Do any of you know in foreign affairs what he does with Richard Nixon? He sends him to the inauguration of Adolfo Ríos Cortinas in Mexico in December. Before he's even elected president, he is using Richard Nixon as a, for want of a better word, lieutenant, forward observer, someone who goes out and shows the Mexican government, and especially the Mexican president, that he's interested in improving bilateral relations. And for those of you that are not aware, Milton Eisenhower is probably Dwight Eisenhower's front man in dealing with Latin America. He goes to Latin America in 1953 and does an investigation for his brother. And again, he goes there later to do another investigation in Central America. But the point that I'm trying to make here is Eisenhower at the very get-go without advertising, without doing a great deal of, gee, I'm really, really brilliant, and I've really got to show you what I'm doing. I'm sending my vice president to Mexico. He didn't need to. I have never seen any president that I know of, with maybe the exception of Franklin Roosevelt, that was so comfortable in his own skin as Dwight Eisenhower was. Now, Dwight Eisenhower becomes president in 1953. What is his major obligations? His major obligations, he looks at domestic, balancing the budget, which he doesn't do, but which is an issue, and doing various and sundry other things. What does he do in foreign affairs? He solves, he answers the question of the armistice in Korea, which is signed in late uh, July. Well, what, what is this guy doing to formulate foreign policy? What he's doing is he's educating the people that work with him. He uses the cabinet. And by the way, there are maybe 300 plus cabinet meetings recorded. And if any of you want to read them all, you're more than happy to do that. He has all of the NSC meetings, probably 300 plus there also. And if you want to read them, you can. One of us in the auditorium has read all of them. And that's me. But the point is, if you read the meetings, he is using the cabinet and he's using the National Security Council as an educational tool. He's telling people what he is looking forward to in various sections of the world. And because he is pretty much confined to the United States much of the time by his domestic agenda, he sends Richard Nixon out on a goodwill mission. That's what all of Nixon's missions were called. And if any of you read foreign policy books or if any of you read you know, standard histories of the United States, the only thing you see is Richard Nixon being stoned, I mean that literally, in South America and or pointing his finger at uh, Nikita Khrushchev at the American Exposition in 1959. Well, let's take a look. The first time Eisenhower sends Nixon out, he sends him to New Zealand and Australia. Those are his first stops. Why is he doing that? He's sending Nixon there to tell New Zealand and Australia, we're with you, and you're part of us. It's important for us to support you. He then sends Nixon up, including Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and Hong Kong, and Japan, and Korea, and in addition, Taiwan. Now, without going into order, he goes to, North, to, to, to Vietnam, and he says, 
what are the French doing and how are the French operating? He is to come back and tell the president. He goes to uh, South Korea and s presents a letter to Syngman Rhee and says to Syngman Rhee, don't think about doing anything wacky with the North Koreans. Because if, if you do something, we're going to cut you loose. He goes to Shang and says to Shang, don't think about an invasion of the mainland. We're not going to support it. And he goes to uh, Japan and says, you know, we thought initially that you should not rearm. But now we think you should rearm. If any of you are reading today's newspapers, the debate still goes on how much more money the Japanese are going to uh, pay in regard to their uh, uh, defense of their own homeland. And again, he goes out to the Philippines, where they are somewhere, and he goes and he supports Ramon Masesi in the election to be uh, uh, president of the Philippines. Idea being, it doesn't sound to me like this is just a goodwill mission. It sounds to me like the President of the United States is ordering his Vice President to speak in his place and tell Asian leaders and various other leaders that this is the direction of American foreign policy. And what I found remarkable was if you take a look at every time and everybody that goes out for Eisenhower, on a foreign policy mission, you'll never guess where they stop first for a briefing in the White House. They get a briefing from the president, and you'll never guess the first place they go to when they come back. They get a debriefing from the president of the United States. So these issues are not kind of glad hand shaking. They're for real. They have a specific purpose in mind. And one of the places that Nixon goes to in 1953 that's put on his agenda towards the end of his mission is where? It is right there. And if any of you can't figure out what that is, that is the Shah. And he's put on the agenda by the State Department and by the President to demonstrate U.S. support for the Shah of Iraq. So the nature of what Eisenhower is doing through various representatives is a very sophisticated way of formulating American foreign policy. Now, if you've ever seen a cabinet picture or a National Security Council picture, he's sitting either in the middle or the top of the thing. And what does Nixon and the rest of these uh, major foreign policy people do when they come back? They make a presentation in front of the cabinet. Is Eisenhower necessarily there? No, he's already heard it. These guys are basically using what he says and preaching to the choir about what American foreign policy should be like. Where do they go next? They go to the National Security Agency, and pardon me, the National Security Council, give a similar speech, only classified, to say, here's what we're doing in American foreign policy. And then where do they go next after that? They go out into the market and they speak in front of the media, and they speak at this particular place, at that particular place, to present the, the, the Eisenhower view of American foreign policy. It is so simple. It seems to me to be really evident, and yet no one's ever written about it. I don't know why. My only, my only theory is the way we're trained, and the way I was trained, is you go to the National Archives, I think now at Archives too, in, in College Park, and you read all the, the diplomatic papers. And then you go to the Eisenhower Library, or the FDR Library, or the Kennedy Library, or wherever, and then you see what the President has to say about it. But you don't get the literally commingling of sources to figure out what these people are really doing. Now, this is 19... 53, am I wrong? I mean, 
is this, is this nonsense? Do I, I, I'm just making up one particular thing? Let's test to see how I'm doing. Next place Nixon goes is in 1955, and he goes to Central America and the Caribbean. And what does he do while he's there? He helps to again establish firmer U.S.-Mexican relations. He goes to Cuba and talks about the sugar quota there, which is mammoth to the Cubans then and today. He goes and helps negotiate a border uh, end of a border conflict between Costa Mesa and Nicaragua. And he also goes and he sees all of these people about the establishment and growth of the Pan American Highway. Is it only goodwill? Is it more than goodwill? How do you look at the various people that Nixon sees? Well, he goes and sees Trujillo. Trujillo is arguably one of the world's worst dictators that anybody's ever seen. And he stays hands off. And other people uh, that he sees that are dictators, he tries to stand hands off. But at the same time, he is talking about encouraging the Americas to move more forcefully towards democracy. And Nixon keeps a series of what are called platters. And these are his notes on 404 different occasions of things that he talks about. Some of them are critical. And one of them, for example, is a day-by-day -day account of, of uh, Nixon's relationship with Joe McCarthy as Joe McCarthy uh, destructs. But again, let's take a look at where he goes next. A any of you ever hear of Hungary? I'm assuming maybe some of you have. Well, where does Nixon stop in 1956? He stops in Austria after the Hungarian Revolution. And what does he do there? He's there on a humanitarian mission where he says to the, to, to the Austrians and to the Europeans and to Americans, we got to help these Hungarians resettle out of, you know, the communist control Hungarian government. Sounds like a humanitarian gesture to me. But when I did the research, I found out that in the 1952 campaign, Dwight Eisenhower is talking about mammothly changing the American quota system and changing the nature of how many refugees can come into the United States. And part of the program is, in 1956, there's a special exemption that's done to let additional Hungarian refugees in. There's also legislation that Eisenhower proposes to change immigration laws. It fails, but it's there 10 years before Johnson finally uh, uh, gets it passed in Congress. Again, is this guy doing this haphazardly? I find it hard to believe. He's doing all of this stuff purposefully. And it's working. He's doing it with great skill. And yet, Eisenhower isn't coming out and saying, folks, I'm really cool. Isn't this a really good idea? You know, come kiss my feet. He's doing it quietly without great fanfare. And it works. Who is the, the, the guy that is publicizing Hungarian refugees coming to the United States? It's Richard Nixon. Does he do it well? You bet he does it well. He's on national television, he's on radio, he's on all kinds of stuff, which he does. Any of you know first major elected figure that goes to black Africa? Nineteen fifty seven at the the independence of Ghana. Who's going there? Richard Nixon. First major 
elected official in the United States to go to, North, uh, to, go to Africa. He goes to the inauguration of Nkrumah. And who does he meet at the university? A guy named Martin Luther King Jr. He goes across the whole central area through Uganda. He goes to, to uh, uh, Sudan. He goes to Ethiopia, etc. And he's not only doing that, but if you look at also where he goes to uh, uh, Algeria, uh, Libya, Sudan, Ethiopia, they're all surrounding Egypt. And who is control of Egypt? It is Nasser. Eisenhower is asking Nixon, go there, but I also want you to come back and give me an assessment of how Nasser is doing and how much of a problem he is in Africa for American interests. Do I need more? 1958, Nixon goes to South America. He only misses Chile as far as that, and he's already been to Brazil. So he goes to the countries. He's treated relatively well uh, in most of the countries until he gets to Peru, and he's treated uh, at the University of San Marcos, stuff thrown at him and all kinds of, you know, hurling things and calling him names. And then, of course, he goes to Venezuela, where he almost dies. And as a matter of fact, uh, afterwards he tells the ambassador to Peru that he thought he was going to die. And while he is being attacked by a mob, when a thoroughfare going into Caracas and they're rocking the boat, his Secret Service agent pulls out his gun and said, let's kill a co you know, some of these son of a bitches before they get us. And, and Nixon says to him, you know, holster your gun until I tell you to, you know, hopefully we will be okay. But he goes to South America, again, as a, another specific thing that Eisenhower wants on what are the conditions because he has Milton Eisenhower doing this, other people doing this. He wants an update to see what is going on there. And if you read the oral history of Dean Rusk, Dean Russ credits the Eisenhower administration with starting the Alliance for Progress. And it's true. The nature of how Eisenhower uses Milton Eisenhower and others to get closer, even before Castro, but especially after Castro, is part of the process. Where is the last place that Nixon goes for Eisenhower? I think it's called the Soviet Union. And he goes there, and all of us know about the picture of uh, Nixon and, I, and, and Khrushchev pointing at each other and saying, you know, you'll live under us and we'll live under you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a PR gimmick, right? Nixon is opening up the American ex exhibition. Sounds like a Goodwill gesture, you know, a, a kumbaya moment where the Vice President of the United States is opening up the American Exposition? How about maybe Eisenhower says, I want you to go to Russia and I want you to give me an assessment of Nikita Khrushchev because guess what? I'm inviting Khrushchev to the United States, and I want the most current, up-to-date information I can get. And guess what happens? When Nixon returns, the first thing he does with Eisenhower is gives him his assessment of the key to Khrushchev. And who is there? And Nixon recommends, goes on the journey with him, Milton Eisenhower. And both of these men are giving the president an assessment of what he's going to deal with when they come uh, to, the, when Khrushchev and company comes to the United States. Because Eisenhower wants this additional material to figure out 
what he's going to do and how he's going to treat the key to Khrushchev. And to give you some idea of how serious he was, Eisenhower's personal representative to Khrushchev is one of the men in the administration he admires most, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. So my presentation to you is basically, I don't think stunning, brain surgery, but I don't know why nobody got it. Why nobody understood that, yeah, you have diplomats trained to manage American foreign policy in many ways at various levels. But Eisenhower had a global view, which in which, in which view was the overarching anti-communism, which pervaded just about everything in the 1950s and 60s. But here he is doing what he's doing and having this global approach to what he's doing, using Richard Nixon as a major conduit. And by the way, the story about Richard Nixon and, and, and Dwight Eisenhower hating each other, having friction in each other, and uh, did, uh, all the rest of the good stuff with each other is pure unadulterated nonsense. It, 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 just, it, it, it is so far beyond what happened. And one of the best things uh, to show that is Eisenhower hardly ever wrote handwritten stuff. It always went through typing and signing his name and all the rest of the stuff. When Nixon and his wife come back from the first trip in 1953, Eisenhower sends him a handwritten note on how wonderful a job he did. Doesn't sound to me that this was distrust. It sounds like this was trust. In addition to that, there are all kinds of notifications which give you another idea of how untrustworthy the Nixon-Eisenhower relationship was because Eisenhower recommended that Nixon not run for the vice presidency in the second term and he take a position as uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Commerce, or something like that. Well, the good news is, for us, we have a general in the audience. And the bad news is, that's not the way Eisenhower looked at it. Eisenhower viewed Nixon's first term vice presidency as a success. And I don't know how many of you are military people, but the idea is if you do one job well, you get another job. And the other job is not a second term as vice president. The other term is, is what you need experience in, which unfortunately for Nixon he never had, and that was managing a large, large bureaucracy. From a pure job standpoint, Eisenhower was absolutely right. Nixon should have taken a big job. But from a political standpoint, he didn't get that it would look as a demotion. So here again is the difference between these two guys. I'd like to give you a closing thought. If you read Mandate for Change, and if you read Waging Peace, they're really kind of boring. He really doesn't say Joe McCarthy was a dirtbag or I tried to stick a, a knife between his shoulder blades or something like that. It doesn't work that way. Eisenhower just tells a brief story. Even though I found a memo from uh, Herb Brownell, who was the Attorney General, to Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. in his papers in 1974 saying, do you remember the first time that Eisenhower told us to meet in his office so we could get Joe McCarthy? I'm going, what a kumbaya moment for me. Great stuff. But if you read those things, you see, one, that Eisenhower, for example, I, I, I would imagine you all know about the checker speech and Nixon saving himself during the, next, the, 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 uh, the checker speech. Eisenhower spends four or five pages. It's over in four or five pages. He moves on to the next thing. This man, and I'm guessing now, maybe because he had millions of lives in his hands on a daily basis in World War II, 
stops worrying about stuff after it's closed. If you read the Nixon thing, Nixon spends a whole chapter on the checker speech and never gets over it. And when Nixon publishes Six Crises in 1962 and Eisenhower reads it, Eisenhower says to somebody, I never thought that way. I never knew that Richard Nixon was upset. Here is my imaginary copy of my book. If you take a look at it, there's only one appendix. And that one appendix is Eisenhower's notes on Nixon's checker speech. And if you read just about every story, pardon me, every fable that's written on this, you find out this great dramatic description of Eisenhower listening to Nixon's checker speech and getting so angry, he stabs his pencil into his notes and rips the pages. I'm not sure if you all know what cherry picking is, but cherry picking is when you look at documents and you say, well, I'm going to look at box one, I'm going to look at box 50, I'm going to look at box 75, I'm going to look at box 100, but I'm going to give people the impression I looked at them all. And they don't. To tell you how bad the Nixon papers are, I went through the 320 series, which is alphabetical series of a mere 847 boxes. The end of those boxes, the last 50, were so dusty and bad, I wore swimmer's goggles, a face mask, a, a gown, and I had a, you know, something to wipe it off. The best I could do on a regular basis was a half an hour, and nobody was in the room where I did it other than myself. That may give you an idea that I might not have all of my marbles, and you probably would be right. But the fact is, the story could have been changed. The Nixon papers were open for 25 years before I saw it, and these, you, the, 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 the Eisenhower notes were available for 25 years, but who in the world is Alan Lowell? He's not Nelson Rockefeller, he's not Harold Stassen, he's not Lodge, he's not Rockefeller, he's not anybody. So why bother looking at it? All you're going to find is the most important document in 847 boxes. So when I saw this, this is what you call, you know, a historian's eureka moment. And I'm going, where are the stubs? Where are the, the breaks in the paper? Where is the animosity that Eisenhower shows when he does the, the, uh, the evaluation in the checker speech? It never happened. But the story that's got to be told, or by some people that want to tell the story, is this great animosity between these two guys that one, never happened, and two, if you look at the minimal documents, see it never happens, and also that Richard Nixon was not a scumbag his entire life. If he wasn't, you know, awful as vice president, then where does the story go as president? I mean, does he change? You don't answer that question. There was an awful book written by Fran Brody, and she died before it was published, so I don't even know if she wrote it. On a stack of Bibles, the jacket says, Richard Nixon was a congenital liar before he was born. How do you write good history? Or how do you write real history when you're fighting a war that should never be fought? One of the, the my great things is, is this is about three million pages of documents. And the book that, that, that is out there now was cut by a third. And I guarantee you I cried at every word. But it made it a better book. And the idea behind it was not me being a Democrat. I am a Democrat. When I use Democratic sources, I'm a Republican. When I use Republican sources, I'm a Libertine. When I'm reading Libertarians, 
I'm even a socialist when I'm reading Norman Thomas. It's whatever the documents show. You don't need to make up data when you look at that amount of material. And I'm hoping that at some point in time, those of you that are, are scholars or prospective scholars or graduate students or, or just careful readers, that you don't read this, some of this stuff that is just nonsensical, but you read it with clear, thoughtful minds and you say to yourself, self, does this make sense? And hopefully, you know, my parting comment is that when you take a look at my book, it will make sense. Thank you for your time. Do you, what's the question? If you did not hear him, he said it's fortunate we're talking about because this is the celebration of Eisenhower's uh, 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 commission in the Army. But, sir, I've got to go one better than you. It's also the 124th anniversary of his birth. Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay. With the, the mind of Richard, wonderful talk, but uh, the, the mind of Richard Nixon as the 1956 election approaches. Ike has heart is, had his heart attack, and is Nixon concerned that if he leaves the vice presidency, that whoever, and Eisenhower dies in his second term, that whoever becomes president might get, um, be renominated in 1960, and Nixon's chances of becoming president would be forever foreclosed, or that if he, however warm and fuzzy his relationship with Ike was, that whoever got the vice presidency in his stead would become Ike's new golden boy, and Nixon, despite um, wonderful defense experience, would be gently pushed, pushed out of the way. Um, the question only would take about five chapters in my book. Uh, I have a, a five chapters on that. Uh, basically what happens is, is Nixon is very worried. He is so worried that he is taking probably 10 different barbiturates for insomnia and for uh, uh, tension. And one of the things that I did when I looked at this stuff was, boy, I was so happy. I'm seeing this guy taking all these pills, and I'm figuring that there's Dr. Feelgood out there, and, and I really got them, you know, here's another, you know, Elvis Presley moment. And I said that the two doctors that practiced back in the day, and also a pharmacist that practiced back in the day, and they said, yeah, some of this stuff was really ugly, especially a thing called Tulanol, which was a hallucinatory. But he said, that was the best we had at the time. We didn't know any better. But how bad was Nixon worried about this? Big time. He was worried about it. But you know who was worried about it even more? Harold Stassen. Because Harold Stassen figured if Nixon won the renomination, which he already had, by the way, in the bag, that Stassen could not run for the presidency in 1960. And he was a snake in the grass. Hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, first, I, I can top even both of you two. I was a friend of Professor John Walton of Johns Hopkins, whose uncle, U.S. Senator, Kansas U.S. Senator Joseph Bristow, got Ica's nomination to West Point in 1911. And John Walton and I both knew, well, he knew Milton Eisenhower. I was an undergraduate at Johns Hopkins. And our view of Milton is far less idolatrous than yours. But I want to ask you this constitutional question that Raoul Berger raised in 1974 with his book, Executive Privilege. Um, everybody was wondering where this pernicious notion of executive privilege that Richard Nixon was hiding the Watergate tapes and other documents behind, what, where did this notion come from? And it was invented by Eisenhower and his lawyers to protect Ike's army from, from Senator McCarthy's entirely legitimate investigation of internal security within the army. How come you never raise this question? And that key year of 1954 is when the Bricker Amendment's defeated. This is the last time the Congress asserts any, asserts any um, oversight power over foreign policy. And you seem to be cheering and smiling and grinning about this, but it's given us all these wars 
and all these over, uh, CIA overreaches that the Dulles brothers committed with Ike's approval. How come you never raised this question, Professor Gelman? And I've read 40% of your book, and I'm very impressed by it. Well, thank you. And, and one, you're right. Uh, uh, unfortunately for me, uh, the nature of how Ike went after McCarthy and executive pri uh, privilege, you are spot on. And David Nichols. But in your book, you don't bring this up at all. And this is a huge constitutional question. I, I understand. You've been dying for 61 years. People, have, soldiers have been dying because of these illegitimate wars. And you're, and you're celebrating Ike. That's I understand that. I'm saying to you, you know, and I don't know how much you publish. And I will just tell you that the war I fought over every word I reduced, and part of it was the Brooker Amendment, I can't tell you you know, how much a commercial book or an academic commercial book like this takes. And the nature of executive privilege and the time I would have to go into Eisenhower, McCarthy, and executive privilege, I didn't have the space for it. You know, I would have loved to have talked about it. And the other point, you know, that you make uh, uh, is also a valid point. And by the way, I wasn't smiling at you. I was smiling at myself because... The problem. Uh, no, I didn't. I, not. I'm not worried about me. But um, we have to see this dark side of Ike. We oh, have no, no, to. No, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. The presentation today was basically to start the thought that Ike was a complex, complicated individual that nobody's written about. Uh, you know, one of the problems that I have, and I presented this at other places, is how in the world. Can we write about Eisenhower in 1950s and call him a golf playing twit that didn't know what he was doing? Use the same fact pattern that we're using today and call him brilliant. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, I, and I don't have a solution for that. All I know is what I tried to do was try to get as much stuff as I could into the finite material. And, and by the way, Yale was unbelievably kind. When, when they saw the page numbers increasing, they started to sweat. And they said to me, you know, yeah, this is an important book, but yeah, you got to cut it by a third. And some of the stuff that you were talking about is, is gone on the cutting room floor. I would love it if you'd write about it. Because uh, uh, nobody no, I, has. I will write a review of that. I'm glad you said that. I'll mention in the review, but I hope you publish it somewhere. By the way, the CIA officers in 1953 and 54 were plotting to assassinate Senator McCarthy because of his investigations of the CIA disasters in the, during the Korean War. The audience needs to know that. That too. I did not know. That's, all, it's all, in Tim Weiner's Legacy of Ashes, his history of the CIA. Okay, unfortunately... Uh, I also read uh, uh, Tim Weiner's One Man Against the World. Uh, one, of his, one of his things that he says is that John Ehrlichman, you know, refused to work for Nixon in the 60 election uh, unless he got off the sauce. I checked the footnote. I checked the source. It never happened. Ehrlichman never drank. Never I'm not drank talking about wine, Ehrlichman wine. drank. No, yeah. I'm talking about Nixon drinking. Oh, Nick, well, yes. I've got a story to tell you. All right. Well, we'll wait for that. Yes, sir. Um, you, you noted that uh, one of the uh, reasons why uh, Eisenhower was so prepared to be president is because of his global vision that he acquired during uh, uh, traveling abroad and so on. And some of the presidential candidates these days have traveled abroad, business, uh, professional conferences, and so on. Is it because Eisenhower traveled uh, for the military and that he got that particular uh, experience and is that something that's lacking now because I don't know of any presidential candidates that really have the military background. Um, tough question, good question. One, the difference between the folks that go around for commercial reasons or business reasons is one thing. But Eisenhower also went to various colleges and took various courses on strategy. So he is always thinking in a global setting. These other folks are not necessarily thinking like that. Whatever you think of, of, of Richard Nixon, he, he had 
a, 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 a real serious training in foreign affairs because he sat at the National Security uh, uh, Council, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem with most of these people that are doing this without military training and without going to community college or Yale or Princeton or University of Maryland or wherever is they, they simply aren't trained to look at various things that they should, i.e., whether uh, you agree with, with Obama when he ran against your, uh, 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 Romney or not, when he said the Cold War is over and we don't have any problems with Russia? I don't think so. Yes, sir. Um, a few questions. Um, you, you started out by saying that, um, obviously, Eisenhower traveled all over the world, um, and he gained in that travel by walking uh, with all of these different people, and also his fundamental, um, uh, what he had to do during the Second World War to lead the Second World War. He had to, to you know, to continually negotiate with all of these very strong-willed men, uh, which, you know, learned him a lot about how to deal with the world that he was going to, and, you know, his role at, at president of Columbia University, et cetera, et cetera. But you started by saying that he had gone to Panama, and in, I'm from the Caribbean, and he, um, in Panama, he started to understand the importance not only of the Panama Canal, but of the Caribbean region, which goes back very uh, early on in American history, even before the United States came about. You know, people like John Adams and Eisenhower, I mean, and Jefferson, et cetera, understood the importance of the Caribbean for U United States uh, geopolitical you know, positioning. Um, then that raises a question, obviously. And it raises the question, if Eisenhower believes that the Caribbean is such crucial geopolitical and geostrategic importance for it, right? you have under Eisenhower the Cuban Revolution happening, right? Uh, he was well aware, and this I think he didn't even talk about this, especially um, U.S.-Soviet um, relationships, which a lot of times were very, very, very problematical during that time, Hungary, I mean, Suez Canal, et cetera, et cetera. Berlin, um, he knew from U2 flyovers that the Soviet Union was a joke, militarily speaking never said anything about it, continually, in essence, to build up the U.S. Uh, um, a military claiming that the Soviet Union was really a challenge, when he fully well knew that the Soviet Union was a joke, yeah, militarily speaking. Um, so, knowing all of that, Cuba happens, right? Why doesn't he say, well, you know, simply, um, this cannot be tolerated, we will put an end to this. Um, is it a fact? And another issue that I have with you also is you say Nixon goes on this trip for the Latin America, because that shows very ugly view on Latin American people, right? Why would they be enraged with, with, with Nixon since seemingly, if you listen to what you are saying, the United States is doing beautiful things in Latin America, spreading democracy, freedom, and human rights, which is not what is, what is going on here, right? The United States is backing, in my place, one of the most vicious, violent, destructive human beings in, in um, Trujillo, uh, and, and then right across the border, Papa Doc in Haiti, right? Let's not forget him. And then right across the border, Batista in, in, uh, in, Cuba. Uh, in Cuba, right? And all the Latin American dictators, the violent Latin American dictators. So let's be honest why Latin Americans can be outraged with, with the United States, right? I mean, you are backing the most vicious, violent, brutal people. And every time, I mean, you talk about NASA, right? Part of the non-alignment movement, right? You know, I mean, he's a man of, of, a, of a certain sophistication. He could have said, look, um, we are in this international competition with, with um, the Soviet Union, right? The non-alignment movement is not going to do much in this larger sense. We can walk with that. Uh, so I, I was, when, when Castro comes to America, he walks away and leave. Nixon takes, take care of him. Yep. And then Nixon has very contemptuous things to say about, about, yes, about Castro, right? Yep. Castro's a kid. Well, let me just explain to you. Castro's no, one... Sir, Castro, Yes, yeah, so the question is, you, no, you go, I, I got it. so Cash was one thing, he's not a kid, right? You could disagree or agree with him, but that's what not he is. He's standing for, for a different type of Caribbean, I so I, I want to hear let, what Let me answer. Through. First question, Nick Eisenhower is so smart, why doesn't he claim that there's really not a great threat? Have you ever heard of a guy named John Kennedy? Stuart Symington, Lyndon Johnson. You ever hear of a thing called the Missile Gap? 
I mean, these guys wrongly complained that we weren't doing enough because the Soviet Union was so far advanced. Well, Eisenhower had a choice. He could either tell them about the U-2 and what was going on and how poorly trained the Soviets were, or keep it hidden and keep on doing it. Now, the truth is that Eisenhower and knew that the Russians knew about our overflights. But even then, he wasn't the kind of guy who was going to divulge that, because he was still the five-star general who was the 800-pound canary that was going to sit anywhere he was. The second point of your question about how in the world do we reconcile brutal dictators with democracy, we've been answering that question from ad infinitum. I mean, that's, you know, that, you know, why would anybody support Trujillo? I can't think of any reason why Eisenhower would support Trujillo, other than the fact that Trujillo was such a, a brutal, repressive dictator that they couldn't get rid of him. Same thing was true with Papa Doc, the same thing was true with Batista, the same thing was true with uh, 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 samosas, etc. There, there is a responsibility that the United States has if you consider us exceptional. The problem is, is and my first two books, for your benefit, was one was on Roosevelt and Batista, the other one was called Good Neighbor Diplomacy. And one of the reasons why I don't write about U.S. Latin American relations is there's no market for it. You know, the amount of people in the United States that buy books and read about U.S. Latin American relations is like that. I mean, we're talking minuscule. And so when you're talking about the U.S. government, which is this unwieldy behemoth, the points you're making are tragically true, but I don't know how you awaken a sleeping giant to understand you know, the nature of poverty and, and, and caudillism, for want of a better word, in Latin America, and at the same time for the amount of anti-get involvement that we're living through now to be part and parcel of this. I, 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 this. Where, is that it? Thank you for coming. <laughs>